Okay, um, welcome everybody. Um, I'm really excited for this webinar. Uh, this is the webinar on the anti-colonial tradition, imperialism, class struggle, and ecology. Uh, my name is Ian Reynolds. I'm going to be moderating this webinar, um, and I'll just say a little bit about uh, about um, how it's going to work. We're going to hear from each of our three panelists, Jared Bly, Eli Portea, and uh, Larry Allen Busk. Um, and then we're going to have some time for question and answer as well. So um, we're actually going to do questions at the end of all three of the papers. So if you have a question, just, um, just you know, um, hold on to it until the end. We'll have a lot of time for discussion. Um, just some notes about, um, about this event really quickly, some important um, 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 important things to know about the organization. This event has been organized by the Critical Theory Workshop. Um, and I believe uh, Gabriel, if you Gabriel is going to be throwing the, the link in the chat. Um, it's organized by the Critical Theory Workshop and co-sponsored by Monthly Review and by the International Manifesto Group. Um, really thankful for the co-sponsorships. And uh, yeah, I'm very appreciative of the Critical Theory Workshop for organizing this. We're going to have a great discussion today. Um, donations are always welcome, even very small ones, because they allow us to continue this kind of free programming. Um, and the donation form can be found on the on the website that uh, you can actually see in the chat that Gabriel's just put in the chat. Um, so the next Critical Theory Workshop event is on November 14th. It's on Dominico Lasordo's work. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a link to that as well um, that I can just quickly throw in the chat. And for information on the Critical Theory Workshop Summer School, um, you can check the website as well, which, which Gabriel has thrown in the chat. Um, so without any further ado, uh, we're gonna start the webinar on the anti-colonial tradition, imperialism, class struggle, and ecology. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce um, the, the speakers before they speak. So first we have Jared Bly. Uh, Jared Bly is a philosopher and translator who's currently teaching at Villanova University, um, just outside of Philadelphia, PA. His research focuses on Marxist aesthetics and the ongoing struggle against imperialism, um, particularly in Africa. Uh, and I'm uh, really excited for Jared's talk. So um, yeah, without further ado, Jared, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Ian. And thank you uh, to Gabriel, the Critical Theory Workshop and everyone uh, coming today. I'm gonna share my screen really briefly. Hopefully this works. I don't need to share the sound. And all right. Everything good with the visualization here? Yeah, I think so, Jared. Um, if you wanna, yeah, if you wanna, oh, not anymore. <laughs> Great, yeah. There we is, go. So all good for the visuals here. All right, um, just so we can anticipate where I'm gonna go with this very quickly, this little talk will have three or more like 3.5 parts. So I'm gonna start talking about Sort of just laying bare some materialist historical materialist concepts. I'm going to talk about imperialism as formulated by Lenin, then neocolonialism, uh, and then I'm going to sort of pivot, uh, switch registers a little bit, and talk about uh, Burkina Faso, um, both past and present. And so I want to conclude actually with um, talking about what's going on in Burkina Faso as well as the larger African conjuncture right now. Uh, but it's really going to be a concluding discussion. Uh, so hopefully we can maybe talk more about the details in the chat uh, or in the in the discussion afterward. Um, yeah, so slide one. Uh, in his path-breaking path essay on the topic, Vladimir Lenin defines imperialism as capitalism at a certain stage of its development in which concentration itself, as it were, leads straight to monopoly. The competitive anarchy with which Engels characterized the preceding phase of industrial capitalism transforms into its opposite, that is, monopoly, the proprietary concentration of capital in fewer and fewer hands, with the establishment of large international cartels controlling its investment, distribution, and regulating its incessant expansion. The consolidation of international monopolies coincides with the triumph of banks whose role shifts from being mere fiscal intermediaries to sovereign global institutions, having, quote, at their command, almost the whole of money capital of all the capitalists and small businessmen, 
and also the large, uh, larger part of the means of production and sources of raw materials in any one country and in any number of countries. For Lenin, the primacy of banking institutions signals the true metamorphosis of, quote, capitalism into capitalist imperialism. Hence, and this is another quote, the 20th century marks the turning point from the old capitalism to the new, from the domination of capital in general to the domination of finance capital. Um, and this is just a, a quote here on the slide that's going to give us uh, this very succinct, succinct definition. But uh, these are this slide is probably going to be a bit more programmatic and helpful, and it gives us the the features of the imperialist stage of capitalism. Uh, so, due to its centralized monolithic organization, as well as its vast international network of resources and human labor at its disposal. Finance capital is able to exact, quote, enormous and ever-increasing profits from the floating, com floating of companies, issue of stock, state, and state loans, and thereby levies tribute uh, upon the whole of society for the benefit of the monopolist. The totality of global capitalist production, the international division of labor, and the entire ideological superstructure itself are thereby subordinated to the interests and logic of finance capital, and the imperative for an ever-increasing accumulation of surplus value. So this is 2012 GDP of countries, but it gives you an idea of the sort of geographic distribution of these relationships. Uh, and you know, if if any, especially if Eli or Larry wants to, we can pop back to any maps, maybe in the discussion too. So I'm just gonna sort of move on. Um, Importantly, imperialism is first and foremost most rigor rigorously and objectively understood as an economic phenomenon. This is what historical materialists, mat historical materialism allows us to sort of circumscribe. Contrary to the liberal multicultural imaginary, imperialism is not reducible to militarism, to settler colonialism, nor even to a uh, mere cu a cultural imposition or appropriation qua foreign interference in forms and practices of social life. Although at times it deploys such tactics, a viable critique of imperialism must, above all, proceed by way of political economy. This approach theorizes imperialism, according to Samir Amin, as the realization of, quote, the law of globalized value, coherent on one hand with the basis of the law of value proper to capitalism, as discovered by Marx, and on the other with the realities of unequal globalized development. Just as the degree of the exploitation of labor, the ratio between socially necessary labor time and surplus labor, modulates the valorization, of, uh, uh, valorization process of capital, the disequilibrium of the global law of value in turn expresses the worldwide contradiction between the imperial center and the reciprocal under, underdevelopment of the periphery. Hence, the imperialist phase of capitalism, as Lenin observed, uh, as Lenin observes Marx, quote, the predominance of the rentier, uh, of the rentier and the financial oligarchy, in which a small number of financially powerful states stand out among the rest. And so we can see this on the map, right? It's going to be the the black or the purple, which are the imperial center. Um, an international relationship of economic subordination, dependency, and the extraction of capital between imperial states and rentier states becomes the principal pattern of capitalism's transformation of the entire globe. In, this in, in these transformations, new forms dialectically emerge from the imminent contradictions of industrial capitalism in such a way that the sublation of determinate structures divides itself and results in, a new, in new operative oppositions of the imperialist phase. In this regard, the imperialist phase signals a new locus of revolutionary agency, which principally arises from the transformation of the class struggle with respect to the existing state apparatuses and thus the existing political divisions dividing the globe. As Ken Anderson argues, and this is the, a quote that I'm, I'm citing here uh, that you see before you, as Ken Anderson argues, uh, quote, anti-imperialist movements for national liberation were to Lenin nothing less than the dialectical opposite of the new capitalist stage marked by monopoly and imperialism. The epicenter of revolutionary potential shifts, at least partially, toward, quote, uh, a new revolutionary subject, anti-colonial revolution. This revolutionary subject finds herself engaged in a fresh set of contradictions and confronted by a different set of challenges 
than that of the classical proletarian political line. Even though the inevitable aim of struggle is for the oppressed masses to seize the state apparatus, so to in in institute the dictatorship of the proletariat, as Marx says, this process does not unfold in terms of the antagonism between bourgeois capital and labor too cool, at least not in the conventional sense. Rather, the struggle over the state apparatus in the colonies takes place between a comprador petty bourgeoisie against a broad coalition of the working class, lumpen proletariat, peasants, and other mar marginalized social, social strata. This new terrain of class struggle opens in virtue of monopoly capital's distinct transformation of the periphery, or in other words, due to the underdevelopment of the periphery itself, to use a phrase of Walter Rodney, which at once appears as a dialectical underside uh, of uh, the rapid advancement of society at the imperial center. So you have this dialectic of underdevelopment and development between the imperial center and the periphery. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to focus on Africa in this talk. Uh, this, this is what my current research is involved in is mainly in Burkina Faso, but also Mozambique and, uh, um, and some other places. But this is just so pre-colonial Africa or pre-scramble for Africa, Africa, and then Africa in at the eve of World War One, right? And we can see the political divisions. Then after World War Two, uh, and then the the sort of current uh, current not not completely current oh no it's actually current it's got south sudan here uh the current geopolitical division of africa um and and the dates of its decolonization so we can sort of have a timeline for this process right so now the second se uh, section we're going to look at the concept of neocolonialism um at the end of the global confrontation of imperialist powers in world war ii the world witnessed the upsurge of national liberation movements across the colonial world from South and East Asia to Oceania, Africa, and the Caribbean. Ever cunning in its rational self-preservation, these national liberation movements did not spell the end of imperialism, unfortunately, but only a transformation of its mode of domination and the precise strategies for, for its ex extraction of surplus. In this vein, philosopher and militant uh, Amil Khan Cabral defines two modes of colonial domination. First, is direct domination. And so I'll, I'll switch to this slide because uh, it sort of breaks down, uh, trying to be really clear about the concepts so we have them at hand, but there's a breakdown of direct versus indirect domination. He says, direct domination, uh, which is defined as, quote, a political power made up of agents foreign to the dominated people, armed forces, police, administrative agents, and settlers, which is conventionally called the classical colonialism. The second is, of course, on the right side here, indirect domination by means of a political power made up of mainly or completely of native agents, which is conventionally called neocolonialism. It is indeed neocolonial domination as Cabral envisions it, which is the political form best suited for the continued imperialist accumulation in face of the ubiquitous demand for national independence in the colonies. Um, it's a mode of surplus generation, which, to the benefit of the imperialists, which no longer requires or only rarely requires violence and projects a public image of indigenous self-management independent and independence within the, the global uh, spectacle. And there's more we can say about this, and we can probably talk about this in the discussion. Um, I also want to say with the obviously ongoing genocide going on in Palestine, uh, that direct domination is not a thing of the past, um, and, and, and it's something that we have to confront. But as I'm going to argue about Burkina Faso, overcoming neocolonial domination and, and, and resisting it and overcoming it is going to require a different set of strategies and a different sort of revolutionary political line. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. But I don't want us to think that direct domination is purely a thing of the past, obviously, with the current events. Um, Uh, so neocolonialism mandates the creation of, and this is another quote, the creation of a native pseudo-bourgeoisie, which generally develops out of a petty bourgeoisie of bureaucrats and intermediaries in the trading system, what is known as compradors. Imperialist domination uh, now boast, bolsters, quote, the economic activity of uh, native elements precipitating new perspectives in the social dynamic, notably by, by the gradual development of an urbanized working class and the introduction of private agricultural property. 
which slowly gives rise to the appearance of an agricultural, agricultural proletariat, end quote. Neocolonial social formations therefore emerge as a consequent of, quote, consequence of, quote, transformations in the social structure determined by significant rise in the level of productive forces, initially sparked by the economic activities of direct or classical colonial, uh, colonial domination. Neocolonialism is essentially a strategic mutation of colonial practice, but one that facilitates streamlines and renders more efficacious the accumula accumulation process for the imperial setting. So it's an extension of imperialism as uh, Lenin understands it, but it's a more effective, more efficacious, and, and, and a more illusory, as we're going to see in this last quote, uh, version of it. The normal class dynamic becomes significantly modified with the shift, giving way to a new skewed vector of struggle within the colonial social formation. And this is a long quote, while in classical colonialism, this process is paralyzed, neo-colonialist domination by allowing the social dynamic to be awakened, uh, conflicts of interest between the native social strata or class struggle. Um, this creates the illusion that the historical process is returning to its normal evolution. This is an important point. Kapal continues, this illusion is reinforced by the existence of a political power, the national state composed of native elements, it is only illusion, since in reality the subjection of the native ruling class to the ruling uh, uh, the native ruling class to the ruling class of the dominating country limits or holds back the full development of the national productive forces. We should here underscore how the passage from the colonial to the to, from colonial to neo-colonial domination creates the outward illusion. That's Cabral's word, a hegemonic consensus both internal to the colonies themselves as well as on the global stage which proclaims a spurious return of the colony to its natural or pre-imperialist course of economic development. This illusion is really crucial um, for, for the maintenance of neocolonial domination and the continuation of imperialism. Um, um, among its many ideological dissimulations, this illusion of political autonomy masks the principal contradiction of neocolonial underdevelopment between the augmentation of productive forces and their degree of socialization. In his study on the development of capitalism in Russia, Lenin furnishes two progressive postulates of capitalist development amid the Russian peasantry. So this is a short quote. One, uh, one, one progressive aspect of, of developing capitalism on the peasant, among the peasantry is the increase in the productive forces of social labor. And the second is the socialization of labor itself. Under normal capitalism, the ever intensifying contradiction between the social character of labor and bourgeois private property inevitably, inevitably precipitates an explosion of proletariat revolution. However, under colonialism and neocolonialism, we witness a steady quantitative increase in the forces of production, yet a conspicuous absence of their collective socialization, as well as a qualitatively deficient growth of the social relations of production. And neocolonialism does this through various means, right? Through like forced labor, also disposable labor, working people to death, and, and a, a lot of other aspects of this absence of the, the uh, collective socialization of neighbor, labor. Um, lots of processes are uh, achieved this, and we can talk about this later. In other words, colonial underdevelopment attains an ever-increasing valorization of capital, but without the usual, uh, the usual complementary development of the working class and its labor conditions which in, under normal circumstances, uh, it would eventually come into co contradiction with uh, the, the bourgeois class. This lopsided process is precisely the mechanism that facilitates the persistence of neocolonialism and the ever-present stagnation and interminable misery within the post-colonial conjunctures of the present. So now the third part, uh, I'm going to talk, we're, we're, I'm not gonna have a whole rundown of the Burkina Bay Revolution of 1983, um, because we don't, I do not have time to do that, but th we can talk about the details. Um, it's led by Thomas San Sankara, who's a Marxist Leninist in 1984. Uh, what I really want to talk about to read the last little bit here is, um, how Sankara's revolution intervened within the class struggle in a certain way as to explicitly oust, not direct colonial domination, but neo-colonial domination. So he says, uh, so, so Sankara was crystal, crystal clear with regard to how neo-colonialism was the explicit form of domination plaguing his native land. 
uh, he, he writes that, uh, or spoke that, <laughs> says this in a speech, France would maintain its stranglehold, stranglehold over our country and perpetuate the exploitation of our people through the use of Voltaic intermediaries. Upper Volta was the name of Burkina Faso before he changed the name of the country. Voltaic nationals were, were to take over its as agents of foreign domination and exploitation. The entire organization of neo-colonial society, says Sankara, would be nothing more than a simple operation substituting one form for another. This process of substitution of political forms does not amount to any palpable difference at all. Thus, we saw the colonial administration replaced by uh, neo-colonial administration identical to it in every respect. The revolution led by Sankara is exceptional because, like the emancipatory struggles led by Samora Machel in Mozambique or Cabral in Portuguese Guinea, it explicitly theorized and thereby success successfully, at least for a time, directed its practical energies against neo-colonial imperialist domination. Sankara's nationalist program, moreover, intervened into the class struggle in order to correct uh, his country's particular economic trajectory. As Kwame Nkrumah discerns regarding African post-colonial states in general, capitalism in the colonies, quote, resulted in the emergence of first the petty bourgeois class and then an urban bourgeois class of bureaucrats, reactionary intellectuals, traders, and the others who became increasingly part and parcel of the colonial economic social structure. This petty bourgeois strata typically ends up aligning itself with the commercial comprador strata structurally, structurally dependent on imperialism. At the end of the colonial period, there was all, in most African states a highly developed state machine and a veneer of parliamentary democracy, concealing a co co coercive state run by an elite of bureaucrats with practically unlimited power. In late 20th century Burkina Faso, the nascent African petty bourgeoisie, as Sankara notes, con quotes, quote, constitutes a vast, very unstable social layer, which frequently, quote, vacillates between the cause of the popular masses and that of imperialism. Generally speaking, this petty bourgeoisie in the end, quote, always ends up taking the side of the popular masses, end quote. Nevertheless, the real issue for Burkina-based society is the neo-colonial function of the petty bourgeoisie within the state apparatuses, the state apparatus, and these other apparatuses here. So I'll almost finish here. Um, Sankara's revolutionary strategy aimed to oust neo-colonial domination at the level, at, at this very level. Quote, for the revolution to be genu a genuinely popular revolution, it must proceed to destroy the neo-colonial state machinery and organize new machinery capable of guaranteeing popular sovereignty. Thus, quote, the primary goal of the revolution, pro proclaimed Sankara, is to transfer power from the hands of the Voltaic bourgeoisie aligned with imperialism to the hands of the popular classes that constitute the people. Due to the overall underdevelopment of the class strata of Burkina-based society, it is not the proletariat alone who must commandeer the state, but a broad alliance of popular classes and struggle against the bourgeois bloc subordinated to the commercial compradors and indeed to external foreign monopolies. This strategy does not seek the complete destruction of the state apparatus or even a violent liquidation of the bourgeoisie, not necessarily, but rather it looks, quote, to make operational the administration inherited from colonialism. Here, by making operational, Sankara suggests quite perspicuously that the revolution must make state machinery serve the people as opposed to serving the accumulation process of imperialism. Well, this last paragraph here. Um, so Sankara names as enemies of the people the various strata of bourgeois, uh, the bourgeois neo-colonial alliance, the state bourgeoisie, the comprador bourgeoisie, and the middle bourgeoisie. The thrust of Sankara's revolution confronts the fledgling petty bourgeoisie and in particular, the state sector of this of this class, who, quote, use the state apparatus just as the industrial capitalist uses his means of production to accumulate surplus value drawn from the exploitation of workers' labor power. This new exercise of state power would then sever, sever the umbilical connection of the comprador bourgeois strata from the, quote, unquote, numerous bonds that it maintains with external monopolies. This maneuver is, of course, much more complex than a simple, ex simple expropriation of the bourgeoisie to poor, since it intervenes in order to play the bourgeois, bourgeois alliance against itself, just as the capitalist divides the working class, sowing discord and fragmenting it in order to hamstring its capacity for organization and effective opposition. And as much as a certain vector of bourgeois class development is necessary for the, for the future of Burkina Faso, it is the petty bourgeoisie which generally represents the vanguard of that development in Africa more generally. The revolutionary potential inherent in this class must be mobilized simultaneously with its amputation by force from the reactionary strata, and in particular, those holding the reins of state power uh, and, and thus maintaining a parasitical relation with imperialism. So uh, I know I'm just about out of time. Uh, so 
I'll just conclude by signaling here uh, that this is not simply a hey, geography or a uh, historical examination of a successful revolution. Um, in the last three years, there have been a number of coups in surprising, unsurprisingly French West Africa. Sudan is not part of that, but it's on here in this map. But in uh, Guinea, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and uh, an attempted one in Chad, and also most recently in Gabon. Um, these are very, very important for everything I just said, because um, like Sankara or Cabral or Samora Machel, uh, the leaders of these struggles are explicitly targeting neo-colonialism as the problem, as, as really the goal of what their revolution is trying to overcome. And in Burkina Faso, we have Ibrahim Trahore, who is obviously sort of, he's been, the media is talking about how he's in, he's conjuring the ghost of Sankara. He has a Sankara getup. Um, and, you know, maybe if we have time during discussion or if we want to, we can look at uh, one of his speeches. Uh, um, but yeah, also there's uh, Abba Durahame Ch uh, Tichani in Niger is, is also targeting neocolonialism, cutting supply chains with France. Uh, and um, especially if, if we think about what, what recently happened, right? Um, the there is a neo-colonial backlash almost immediately against the coup in Niger with ECOWAS, which is the Economic Community of West African States, threatening direct military intervention because of what Niger was doing. Um, but yeah, so I think I'll, I'll stop there um, and turn it over to Eli, uh, who's going to continue this. Um, but but yeah, we can you know talk more about this the current events I think in in the discussion if we want. To. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, yeah, setting a lot of groundwork for the future, for the for the two talks coming up, and uh, yeah, that was that was great. Um, so we're gonna now we're gonna hear from Eli Portea, who is an assistant professor of philosophy at Florida Gulf Coast University. Uh, Eli's research focuses primarily on Marxist theory, especially in its anti-imperialist, ecological, and feminist strains. They're currently working on a book project titled Imperialism at the Brink, Decolonization, Decarbonization, and the Critique of Capitalism. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Eli. Thanks so very much. And uh, thanks for the warm introduction. Um, I'm getting my screen share ready. So I'm just waiting for my PowerPoint to finish powering up. So it's just gonna take a second. It should be loading any moment. Um, in the meantime, I can give you some, uh, you know, preparatory remarks in advance of what uh, I'm going to discuss with you today. Um, um, and that is a couple of things, which is, um, you know, first and foremost, um, some of the remarks I'm going to make today are somewhat preliminary and largely schematic. Um, and the reason for that is that um, specifically the sort of subject of what I want to discuss today is, um, in essence, a work in progress. So as um, Ian just mentioned in that very kind introduction. I'm sort. Of, I have a book project that's underway, and this is sort of the final chapter. So in a way, I'm sort of working out of order, <laughs> and this uh, this is actually sort of the end. <laughs> but I thought I would begin sort of exploring some of the um, claims and uh, justifications that I wanted to provide um, in that sort of final chapter. And so that's essentially, um, you know, what you're uh, going to be experiencing today is this sort of schematic. Um, remarks. So let me see if I can just go ahead and get these open, or rather get my screen share ready for you. There we go. Okay. All right, is it visible to everyone? Or is it saying, there we go, visible? It appears that it is loading still. Okay, well, let's hope it loads faster. <laughs> um, let's see. Hmm. You're, you're good now, I think we can see it. Uh, there's something about the transition to the, to. Yeah, to full screen. Is it better now? Like, are you able to see everything or no? No, we can't see anything now. Hmm, okay. All right, well, I'm gonna try to do it through PowerPoint instead of Google Slides, but my PowerPoint wasn't opening for some reason. 
So let me see if I swap. Sorry. Um, Eli, I can also do it for you if that would be. Yeah. Although clicking through the slides uh, might be a little, uh, that might get kind of stressful. So let me see if I can't just open it. Uh, there we go. PowerPoint finally opened. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. Are you able to see my slides now? Yes. Excellent. Great. Okay. Sorry for the delay, everyone. Um, so, uh, what, uh, as I mentioned, uh, these are preliminary remarks, but I'll just sort of jump right into the content because we've lost a, a minute or two there. Um, but the I'm sort starting, of, I'm starting your time now, Eli. Your time oh, well, now. thanks. How charitable of you. <laughs> um, so the, um, the sort of overall arc of these schematic remarks that I want to talk about today, um, are going to focus on the question of planning or, um, what Baran and Sweezy, uh, the political economists once, uh, referred to as the planning principles. So I'm not so much going to talk about the really specific programmatic or procedural sort of elements of rational planning or planned economies, but I am going to talk about um, the sort of status of planning within the discourse um, among socialists, especially those interested in decolonization and ecology. So just sort of bear that in mind. Um, so first of all, I want to say um, this idea, the idea of rational planning um, is not new. <laughs> in many ways, my intervention is um, as old as Marxism is. Uh, it is actually, I think, a really pivotal and, um, you know, characteristic um, feature of Marxist thought, although it's one that I think um, in recent years has sort of been de-emphasized, um, especially um, I think if we sort of take into account there, these kind of two tendencies that I um, sort of have available here on this slide. So for the record, you know, I don't think these are by any means the only two explanations for why discussions of rational planning have sort of receded from the political imaginary, especially in the imperial states. Um, but I will say these are some uh, pretty decisive contributing factors. Um, and of course, the elephant in the room here is the Cold War, right? Uh, since the end of the Cold War um, and the um, demise of the socialist camp and the Soviet Union specifically being, of course, um, some of the lived examples of planned economies, um, there's sort of been a general embrace of left anti-communism. Um, and this is something that Michael Parenti has written about um, quite extensively and probably better than I could. So I'm happy to sort of refer you to some works on that subject if it interests you. Um, but the kind of basic idea here is that, you know, after the end of the cold, formally end of the Cold War, um, we sort of fall into a moment when socialists internalize the defeat of the socialist camp and essentially uh, abandon commitments to planning, right? It's sort of um, taken as an empirical, um, you know, disproving of planned economies. And so, especially within the imperial states, and we can think of organizations like the DSA, um, which, you know, the ranks of that organization have been swelling um, for quite some time now. Um, since at least 2008, but certainly, um, you know, since the rise of democratic socialism in the U.S. in general. Um, but we see sort of a migration of, you know, leftists broadly, but even socialists by name toward market driven solutions or even market socialism um, and, you know, more populist strategy and kind of a sort of big tent rejection of um, state power or the attempt to seize state power. Um, so there's kind of this um, latent sort of libertarian impulse. And I think that's sort of maybe the kind of broadest problem you encounter. But then there's sort of another problem as it pertains specifically to the colonies. And I think that problem, uh, you know, contributing to sort of the erasure of the planning principle um, is essentially um, what has been called the decolonial turn, um, which confusingly sounds like it should be really great, um, but in many ways, um, you know, actually represents the sort of, um, you know, hegemonic control of academic discourse um, to essentially reduce decolonization to its epistemic, cultural, uh, and largely, you know, philosophical dimensions. And more often than not, its sort of primary intervention is to stake itself on a rejection of anti-colonialism, right? It sort of poses itself as this kind of alternative to the quote unquote failed, uh, those are hard scare quotes for those of you who might not be looking at me, uh, uh, failures of the 20th century decolonizing uh, projects. 
So I think between these kind of two impulses, we sort of get an explanation for why probably one of the most centrally and uh, you know important and definitive features of the socialist project has kind of receded um, from the political imaginary, even as the term socialism is sort of experiencing you know a kind of popular renaissance. Um, so curiously, I think um, if we actually look at the anti-colonial Marxists of the 20th century, um, you know, to some degree, uh, it's not something that I think is as extensively discussed as one might expect, but we get various instances of um, remarks where the idea of a planned economy is simply presupposed, right? It's just so obvious that the conditions of underdevelopment, of ecological, ecological degradation um, caused by colonial agriculture, uh, monoculture, export, etc., essentially require um, a planned intervention to combat the sort of anarchic production um, of commodities uh, characteristic of, of capitalist society. So, um, you know, he's obviously most well known, uh, Walter Rodney, that is, is, is most well known for his investigations of underdevelopment and his sort of um, reflections against the sort of bourgeois mainstream liberal development theory and instead sort of posing, um, you know, as historical materialist conception of, of underdevelopment and its causes. Um, but really right at the beginning of his even most famous work, um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, uh, we get this, uh, you know, indication of the sort of upshot of the book, which of course is to advocate for a socialist model of development um, for the colonies. Um, and he says it sort of, you know, right out. And I won't read the whole passage because it's quite long, but I'll I'll read the bolded part. And he says, um, one of the most crucial factors leading to more rapid and consistent expansion of economic capacity under socialism has been the implementation of planned development. Um, and sort of subsequently in the remainder of the passage, he goes on to say, you know, we can kind of observe the various developments and, and also the sort of coexistence of various modes of production as essentially ad hoc and unconscious, right? Or sort of partial attempts to socialize production, um, but in reality, never really able to consolidate this kind of um, rational, um, you know, and sort of human controlled and therefore, you know, beneficial for human beings um, system of, you know, social organization. And so it's there in Walter Rodney, you know, who, again, whose work is also experiencing a renaissance for which I'm, I'm, uh, you know, quite grateful, if I'm being honest. Um, but uh, it's not something that tends to get emphasized terribly much. So I'm just sort of trying to foreground it here. Um, it's also typical um, for others, uh, decolonizing Marxists, I should say, um, to take up this mantle. Um, it's a pivotal part, for instance, um, of Nierde's model, um, as it sort of was implemented in Tanzania and Samora Machel in Mozambique, um, you know, both of whom, you know, are ready to admit that national independence is sort of a tacit requirement of decolonization, right? One has to boot out the colonizer, certainly that's true, and certainly one has to displace the sort of neo-colonial um, dominators that Jared um, so elegantly alluded to. Um, but moreover, right, the positive upshot of um, the sort of post-colonial state has to be the deliberate organization of society for human need um, and a sort of intentional um, sort of eschewing of capitalist production with its sort of telos, its ultimate goal of profit maximization, right? And the end of day actually gives a really nuanced account of how the socialist state actually even has this kind of dual function. It has this kind of negative function to sort of repress relations of exploitation, but it has this positive function of sort of facilitating that planning, um, you know, including, of course, the collective ownership of the means of production, and then thereby sort of, you know, consciously designing um, that collective ownership to be sort of universally beneficial. Um, and likewise, Machel gives us, you know, a sense that planning, you know, can sort of have this sort of, um, you know, deliberative feature, even if it's sort of centrally managed. Um, and so it very much is about sort of um, being able to assess um, and respond, um, you know, locally, regionally, but also at a national scale um, to the various objectives that, you know, can only be set by the needs of the colonized population. Um, and not, for instance, um, you know, the growth of the GDP or the measuring of per capita incomes as, um, as you know, imperialist institutions like the UN might have it. Um, and so again, you know, the things that I'm sort of trying to highlight here are, you know, not things that I'm sort of drawing from thin air, so to speak. I'm just uh, re-emphasizing things that to some degree have sort of become lost in the mix um, in terms of the discourse around socialism and how to sort of conceive of socialism as a mode of, of production and as it's distinct from capitalism as a mode of, of production. So um, in another sort of valence, and I think this is sort of equally important, um, 
you know, in the book, I'm hoping to, um, I think the title kind of alludes to this, um, to deal with sort of twin tasks, which is, you know, to combat um, the sort of persistent underdevelopment caused by capitalist imperialism and neocolonial relations. And on the other hand, to sort of um, contend with the fact that our species is facing um, its potentially most devastating and existential crisis um, that is known in our history so far. Uh, namely the the coming climate catastrophe. Um, and of course, to some degree, um, these are mutually mediating. You know, the colonies are especially susceptible and vulnerable to um, ecological destruction. They are already experiencing climate impacts um, at an unprecedented scale, uh, whether it be extreme weather events, um, which are sort of ripping through the Caribbean um, at a greater and greater rate, um, and weakening an infrastructure already sort of, um, you know, emaciated by colonial underdevelopment, um, whether it be, um, you know, crop destruction or desertification, as is the case with Burkina Faso, again, as, as Jared already alluded to, um, you know, the colonies are sort of uniquely vulnerable because of their colonial history, and moreover, are sort of less capable of um, developing resilience measures, um, and of course, are lacking in the sort of geopolitical hegemony to be able to shape climate policy. And so, to some degree, I kind of wanted to emphasize that, you know, developing a concept of planning has to be something that responds to the fact that our world is imperially stratified. And I think actually the resources are already there in this tradition as well, um, with, for instance, Tomas Sankara in Burkina Faso, as you know by now, um, and also in Amilcar Cabral, who, um, you know, is uh, in some ways sort of a representative of both um, Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde um, through his organization, the PIAGC. Um, and I think um, Sankara is sort of well known, actually, as an anti-colonial thinker, precisely because of his sort of ecological bent. Um, he um, tends to um, emphasize pretty decisively uh, this particular speech from which the two quotes above are taken is um, imperialism is the arsonists, arsonist of our forests, um, explicitly addresses the fact that imperialism has wrought an environmental um, you know, crisis, essentially. And mind you, this is in the 80s. So, um, you know, now it's perhaps uh, even more true. Um, and so essentially his argument, um, you know, is to say there is no way to combat the sort of imperial um, ecological harm without counterposing the sort of anarchic production of rapacious exploitation of natural resources um, that is driven by capitalist accumulation, except to counterpose to that uh, a form of, of rational and collective management of our natural resources. Um, and interestingly, he actually alludes to um, something that's in capital that I want to spend a minute with on the next slide, um, which is uh, this metaphor of the architect and the bee, um, which uh, again sort of flagging that this is actually something that's present in Marx himself. So for now, I'll hold off. But, um, you know, Cabral, you see another sort of example of this. This passage comes from the PAIGC program, um, wherein, you know, uh, the part, th this sort of section, which is about um, economic independence, um, relates specifically to the question of planning and harmonious development of the economy as sort of specifically balanced in relation to the transformation of the system of cultivation to put an end to colonial monocultivation or what we would call monoculture. Um, and obviously struggling against agricultural crisis. And he very much sort of used this as a class struggle, that the struggle against agricultural crises, drought, glut, and famine um, are essentially class struggles, right? Because they sort of result from the selective expropriation um, of the sort of class stratified neocolonial elite, right? Um, so again, just sort of alluding to um, the sort of resources we already have within the Marxist tradition to sort of begin to develop this kind of concept of planning against ecological uh, imperialism. So to spend a little bit of time with Marx himself, um, before I sort of uh, run down a few things um, in, in a, by way of a conclusion, um, there are these sort of two passages from Capital that I think, um, you know, sum up really quickly um, Marx's own sort of emphasis on the question of um, rational and planned control. Um, there's this sort of longer um, passage, just as a metaphor, about uh, the uh, architect and the bee. And he sort of, um, here he's sort of describing actually the sort of natural and alienated condition of human labor as this kind of transhistorical uh, feature of human life, um, as essentially one which distinguishes between, right, merely the exercising of the organs, um, right? Just the sort of sheer physical activity of production, um, you know, without sort of any real consideration of its uh, limits, its necessities, its technicalities, and it's uh, most importantly, its rationality. 
um, as opposed to the architect, right? And he says, look, the bee is great at what it does. And, you know, also bees are ecologically really vital. So, you know, no shade on the bee, but uh, but realistically, right? Um, the architect always, and to some degree, has an immense advantage over the bee. And the, here he means, you know, that human self-conscious production um, is always actually, you know, more advantageous in the sense that it can sort of um, encounter not only, you know, its sort of immediate experience of its um, physical production, but also interrogate how that might be otherwise, what might be advantageous, plan for the future, et cetera, uh, in, consonance with, in consonance with one sort of, uh, you know, uh, known and understood purpose. Um, and so this latter passage, I think, um, highlights things very well. Um, Marx writes, uh, and I quote, the veil is not removed from the countenance of the social life process, that is the process of material production, until it becomes production by freely associated human beings and stands under their conscious and planned control. Um, so, you know, this is here largely because I think, um, you know, it can't, you, I don't wanna, you know, just assume that everyone sort of has the same interpretation of Marx that I do. Um, but I just want to show that there's, um, you know, this is just one sort of instance of evidence in Marx for the planning principle, but really it's um, it's really all over Marx's work. And I'm, I'm happy to sort of share other places where we can find that and, and talk those uh, texts through if you like. Um, and, you know, I think my sort of ultimate intervention here is to say that, you know, yeah, rational planning has been a longstanding if sort of underemphasized part of the socialist project, and now we need it more than ever. Um, actually, you know, if socialism is going to make this comeback, and I, I think that it, you know it's it's trying to do that, and I think we should celebrate that fact. Um, it needs to do so insofar as it's aware that the alternative to capitalism is not. Um, you know, has to be sort of a planned um, economy. And that, to some degree, that was what marked the socialist project in all of its sort of lived experience historically. So um, let me say a little bit about why I think the planning principle, uh, that is the idea that um, society and the economy ought to be rationally planned, um, is something that I think speaks to both the condition of decolonization and decarbonization. And this will sort of be my concluding remarks, uh, essentially. Um, I think there are exigencies in sort of both of these phenomena that essentially demand um, almost by logical necessity um, that we sort of return to the idea of uh, the, the planning principle. Um, on the one hand, um, right, we have the question of decolonization as one, you know, which essentially describes conditions of persistent underdevelopment, um, you know, uh, which of course is sort of a compounding phenomena, right? It's a sort of multiple deficit. It's not merely like, oh, well, we currently lack the GDP to, you know, purchase, um, you know, importable goods. It's also the case, right? One lacks the infrastructure for hospitals, lacks the infrastructure for agriculture. Um, interestingly, I want to note at this point that all the images um, that you're seeing in these slides actually come from um, a couple different documentaries about Cuban um, agroecology cooperatives, which I think are sort of an interesting way of exploring this question. So I'm just sort of letting you know what your visual landscape has um, sort of been communicating to you in a less uh, in a less overt way. Um, so I also think that, um, you know, if we're going to really consider seriously the possibility of something like a contraction and a convergence model, that is a sort of um, carbon economy that allows us to, um, you know, extend carbon expenditure to, you know, regions of underdevelopment in order to, you know, sort of gain a stable infrastructure, stabilize food supplies, et cetera, um, you know, hospitals, <laughs> schools, basic sort of uh, human needs, um, and at the same time, sort of still nonetheless striving for net zero emissions on the decarbonization side, um, this is going to require planning. Um, I, it's, I think one would be um, incredibly hard pressed to articulate a vision of global economy um, that is able to undertake both of these projects, that is to um, pursue decarbonization um, as sort of a radical alternative to the um, fossil uh, fuel based capitalist economy, and also uh, redress not only historical colonial, um, you know, wrongs and harms, but also to sort of um, you know, de-stratify of the planet in this in this way. I think you would be really hard pressed to do that without uh, some form of rational planning. And again, although I haven't given you the sort of specific um, policies and procedures and what precisely that might look like, because of course it might respond to sort of distinct material conditions, and so there's some variability there. I think the sort of general conversation that we as socialists ought to be having is what does the planned economy in these conditions look like? Um, whereas at the moment, um, it's not clear that we're even even asking about planned economies as an alternative to market-driven commodity production. Um, and so if that's sort of, um, I think, 
uh, the intervention, I, that's where I want to leave it for today. I want to sort of ask that we reintroduce um, into the conversation about socialism today in 2023 in the face of both, um, you know, continued um, imperial domination and colonial underdevelopment and also the exigencies of decarbonization. Um, you know, we need to put uh, planned economies back on the table and the lessons of the 20th century say that that's um, necessary now more, more than ever. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Eli. Um, yeah, you're giving us a lot to think about. I'm excited for the conversation, um, but not before we hear from our third panelist. Um, so next, we're going to hear from Larry Allen Busk. <laughs> Larry is the author of The Right Wing Mirror of Critical Theory, which came out just very recently, uh, and uh, Democracy in Spite of the Demos um, from 2020. Both of those are um, monographs. He's also the article of several articles on climate change. Um, he teaches philosophy and humanities at Florida Gulf Coast University. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I'm excited to hear your talk, Larry. So please go for it. Thanks. That was an interesting slip, Ian. You said I'm the article of several articles, um, <laughs> which is, oh, I <laughs> no, it's fine because it's true. I, I, you know, I am the article. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm going to share my screen. Uh, much like Jared and Eli did. Okay. I'm so glad you pointed that out, Larry. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't let that one go, you know. Like the best slips, it reveals a certain truth, you know. Um, okay, can you all see this, what I'm sharing? Okay, great. Um, what I want to do is essentially just uh, elaborate a little bit uh, on the uh, the stuff that Jared and Eli talked about, um, particularly Eli's intervention toward the end vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ecology and climate change. Um, and essentially what I want to do is just provide a, a reason for going back to some of the figures we've been talking about, figures in the anti-colonial tradition, um, with so many different theoretical tendencies and theoretical dispositions on the the market, as it were, why go back to these people uh, who, you know, functionally no one reads anymore? Um, people uh, like the one I'm going to talk about, and really just briefly, I really want to sort of give the the reason for going back to Cabral and folks like him first, and then just very briefly toward the end, I'll, I'll share a few things that uh, Cabral actually uh, said, um, which I think pertain to, uh, you know, basically the reason that uh, it, the reason that the status quo, the presence that we're in warrants going back to them, and that is uh, the catastrophe of anthropogenic climate change. So we've really sort of turned a corner in the last couple of years uh, with thinking about the exigencies, as Eli put it, uh, of decarbonization. Um, obviously, the 2022 IPCC report, um, if you don't know the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, their big synthesis report that they released in 2022 was pretty dire in terms of timeline for decarbonization. Um, it's generally accepted that uh, a global aggregate temperature increase of 1.5 degrees represents a kind of safety threshold. Um, we can sort of adapt uh, less painfully uh, to a world that hasn't warmed to 1.5 degrees. And um, beyond that, two degrees this is a Celsius, right? Global average uh, aggregate temperature increase. Right? Beyond that, two degrees represents a, a further th safety threshold. So you can think of 1.5 degrees as a guardrail and then two degrees as a guardrail of, for the guardrail or something like this, right? Um, new research that's been coming out, um, one of the articles I have on the screen here was published just a couple of weeks ago in the journal Bioscience, um, or sorry, not that one, the top one there, the one that was in uh, Nature Climate Change. Uh, it says that essentially to remain below the 1.5 degree uh, temperature increase threshold, we have about six years of present emission levels left. So that's the sort of remaining carbon budget, right? So if we maintain the status quo, never mind uh, increasing emissions. <laughs> if we just maintain the status quo, we can do that for six more years and then carbon emissions have would have to fall to zero. Um, so to stay within a kind of basically habitable, basically safe climate future, we need to uh, begin rapid decarbonization right now immediately. Um, uh, scientific articles like the one I have on the bottom here, uh, published in Bioscience, um, 
scientific articles are beginning to say things like uh, life on planet Earth is under siege. That's the first sentence of the uh, the bioscience article I have uh, here on the, the bottom of the screen. Um, also quite quite unprecedented for a scientific article, uh, the authors of this piece say that economic growth is unable to allow for our climate and biodiversity goals. So even the ostensibly neutral value-free sciences are uh, coming out and saying things like uh, economic growth is incompatible with decarbonization and life on planet Earth is under siege. Um, when we talk about 1.5 degrees of warming and 2 degrees of warming, of course, what that means is sea level rise, uh, desertification, fires, floods, famines, these sorts of things, a migration crisis of uh, unparalleled scope and severity. And uh, as is also becoming clear in the emerging scientific literature, uh, it also means death. Um, the sort of uh, new, I don't want to say new trend, um, a new avenue of scientific research is trying to quantify how many people are going to die from the effects of climate change by the end of the century uh, if the uh, safety rails of 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees are reached. Um, the article that kind of kicked everything off was a piece by Daniel Bressler called The Mortality Cost of Carbon. This was a couple of years ago now. Um, he calculates that the lifetime emissions of every three and a half average Americans will cause one excess death uh, uh, between now and 2100, and that's just from excessive heat. Um, the article on the bottom uh, left here by Lenton et al., uh, they put the number closer to uh, for every 1.2 average Americans. Uh, that means one person will die, taking into effect all of the uh, uh, taking into account all the effects of climate change. Um, they also calculate Lenton et al. Do they calculate that um, a warming of 2.7 degrees by the end of the century? which is entirely feasible with present emission schemes, that that will put uh, about one third of the people who are alive right now outside of a habitable climate niche. So we're talking about a, a potentially likely, uh, again, assuming decarbonization does not take place rapidly, we're talking about a, a massive contraction of, of human life um, and people living in habitable climate zones. Um, as many people point out, um, the people who are going to die are largely not going to be people in the, uh, use whatever language you like, the first world, the global north, the imperial centers. Um, they're going to be people in the former colonies. And uh, as is also you know, less, point, less frequently pointed out, this is not just the result of geography. Um, it's mediated by that, but it's also the result of a colonial legacy of underdevelopment. Um, a couple of books have come out recently that I just want to mention briefly. Um, one is called Carbon Colonialism by Laurie Parsons. Uh, I can drop these in the chat after I'm, I'm done talking if folks want. Um, the other is called, it's by Mariko Lynn Frame, and it's called Ecological Imperialism, Development in the Capitalist World System. Um, two excellent books that essentially just track the, um, the reinscription, if you like, of colonial relations uh, in the context of climate change. So when you wake up every morning uh, these days, again, these uh, these three articles, not so much the, the Bressler one, but these three articles are very new. They come out in the last few months. Um, you can wake up and read new stories about these, uh, these, uh, these scientific studies that are being published on the mortality cost of carbon, on the fact that every day we delay the, the task of decarbonization, it's, it's literally costing human lives. Um, so you can you, you can read this. This is available. This is you know uh, uh, knowledge that we have <laughs> as a society, right? Um, in the face of that, in the face of this knowledge, in the face of this this fact, right? What has the liberal democratic response been overwhelmingly? Um, by and large, uh, with very few exceptions, the response from the kind of liberal democratic mainstream, and I would I would also add sort of mainstream liberal democratic theory, um, has been to say. Uh, you know, uh, essentially calm down uh, to say that talk about how we're in a climate emergency is dangerous um, to caution us in one way or another against um, denying climate deniers the right to uh, freedom of speech or the freedom of opinion, right? These, uh, 
these articles all came out in the last couple of years, right? By again, these are not by right wing climate deniers. These are not Fox News articles. These are respectable centrist liberals saying things like, well, climate deniers are still entitled to their opinion. Uh, climate emergency politics is dangerous. We shouldn't be alarmist and so on and so forth. There's no climate change exception to free speech. <clears throat> and um, not always, but often uh, these kinds of articles, these kinds of takes will use one of the three Ps. Uh, uh, they'll, they'll talk about pluralism, they will talk about procedure, and they will talk about participation. Um, so they will say, whatever the dangers of climate change, uh, you can't override our good constitutionalist values of uh, pluralism and uh, proper procedure, constitutional uh, constitutional procedure, and democratic participation. Right? Um, the fact that a, a third of the world's population might die from climate change between now and 2100, on the one hand, but on the other hand, democracy, proceduralism, and uh, and pluralism. Right. Um, just to give you one example. Um, I was, I was struck by this book that came out a few years ago by Christina Lafont called Democracy Without Shortcuts, um, where she, she essentially uh, doubles down on the kind of uh, complete and utter non-negotiability of the democratic procedure. Uh, she says, the only road to better political outcomes is the long participatory road that is, there's one of the P's, participatory. Uh, the long participatory road that is taken when citizens forge a collective political will by changing one another's hearts and minds. So she really doubles down on this, this task of, well, we have to change people's hearts and minds. We can't do anything above and beyond that, right? I wanted to, to just juxtapose this intervention with a couple of uh, headlines that came out around the same time as this book did. One um, showing that uh, 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 a, a town, a town council, <laughs> rejected solar panels because they think that uh, solar panels suck energy from the sun, uh, cause cancer, and will harm house housing prices, right? A community, you know, a town hall voted against installing solar panels in their, their city because of uh, pseudoscientific uh, nonsense. Um, and also a poll that found that very few people are willing to uh, change their personal lifestyles in order to save the planet, right? But apparently, in LaFont's mind, we can sacrifice untold uh, uh, billions of people in the global south um, because first worlders need their democratic proceduralism. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I would regard this this kind of uh, theoretical disposition as um, somewhat uh, sickening, uh, I guess is the word I would use. Um, so maybe we should look away from that, look elsewhere to radical or uh, critical theory, what passes under the name of radical or critical theory in academia. Um, and, and, you know, uh, along these lines, I just wanted to share a few choice quotes that are always sort of stuck in my mind. Um, uh, the first one from our favorite radical philosopher, Michel Foucault, uh, he says that we must turn away from all projects that claim to be global and radical. The claim to escape from the system of contemporary reality so as to produce the overall programs of another society, another way of thinking, another culture, another vision of the world, it's only led to the return of the most dangerous traditions. So um, if you're wondering uh, how you rapidly decarbonize your economy, like rapidly right now, right? <laughs> how you do that without um, trying to articulate programs of another society, another way of thinking, another culture, um, don't worry about it. Right. Uh, and don't worry about the tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people who stand in the way to 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 die from climate change. Um, same thing. Right? If you look to Habermas, right, Habermas tells us that the collapse of state socialism means that uh, the theoretical error of the defeated party was there for all to see. Uh, it mistook the socialist project for the design and violent implementation of a concrete form of life. So trying to design and implement another form of life is, of course, a dead end and it represents violence. Um, the untold deaths from the present system um, apparently don't count too much. Uh, one more short quote from Chantal Mouffe here. She says that pluralism entails the end of a substantive idea of the good life. That's one of the P's again, pluralism. Right? Uh, it entails the end of a substantive idea of the good life. Uh, and if we keep letting the status quo go on as it is because we respect pluralism, including the the pluralism of, of climate deniers, right? She might be uh, more correct than she knows <laughs> by saying that pluralism means uh, the end of the subst of a substantive idea of the good life. So 
I want to contrast this this disposition, this theoretical milieu of pluralism, participation, and proceduralism uh, with something that Cabral said in 1969. Um, he said, to coexist, one must first of all exist. Uh, the conclusion he drew from that was that imperialists and colonialists must be forced to retreat so we can make a new contribution to human civilization, right? And what he's getting at there is, I think, something that uh, applies, you know, uh, even more so today, even more uh, in a global context than in the context in which he said it, right? That um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to talk about a peaceful coexistence or a civil coexistence or something like this with climate deniers or really with anyone who's not committed to the task of rapid decarbonization with a very concrete plan on how to do that. Um, coexistence with these people is not really possible because the uh, the existence of this position, the existence of this disposition um, essentially co-signs, uh, again, potentially billions of people to an unnecessary death and uh, suffering and so on and so forth, right? Um, I also wanted to gesture toward the way Cabral understands the term people, um, which is, again, something that uh, I could have included that as one of the three P's as well. Maybe it's the four P's, right? People, the people, right? Um, uh, Cabral says, again, quite in, in quite con stark contradistinction to the way that contemporary liberal democratic or radical or critical theory understands this term, right? Uh, he says the definition of people depends upon the historical moment which the land is experiencing. He makes a distinction between the people and the population. And he says, the population means everybody. That's the population. But the people have to be seen in light of their own history. Uh, he says, in Guinea and Cape Verde today, the people mean those who want to chase the Portuguese colonialists out of our land. They are the people. And the rest, if you don't agree with the task of chasing the Portuguese uh, out of the land, right, then they are uh, the population, but not the people. The people are those who want what corresponds to the fundamental necessity of our land. And uh, I would wager that you could replace Cabral's specific goal here, right, with the goal of rapid decarbonization and understand the people in a similar way, right? Um, the people are not just anybody. The people are those who are uh, committed to the uh, incredibly difficult and uh, incredibly radical project of uh, rapidly decarbonizing our economy such that we can spare billions of people from an unnecessary death. Um, this kind of, uh, 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 <laughs> I hesitate to use this phrase, but this kind of all or nothing presentation of this issue, this kind of, uh, you know, rejection of, of pluralism uh, when it comes to the task of decarbonization, is sometimes called ecological Leninism. Um, but as I just kind of broadly gestured to here at the end of my talk, right, we could just as easily call it ecological Cabralism. And uh, just to kind of sum everything up, uh, not to speak for Jared and Eli, but I think I can sum up their talks as well by saying that the situation that we find ourselves in now is very much an, an unambiguously uh, an ecological socialism or barbarism. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ian, for moderating. And thank you, uh, Critical Theory Workshop and Monthly Review and uh, International Manifesto Group for hosting this. Yep, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Larry. Um, great. So now that we've heard from all three of our esteemed panelists, maybe we can um, sort of see if we have any questions or if there's any discussion um, that we can get started. So um, we can do this in a couple ways. If you want to raise your hand on Zoom, I think Zoom automatically keeps track of the order in which hands were raised. But you can also put a question in the chat, and I'd be happy to um, to yeah field it. Um, if you're unable to read it, I can read it out loud. Um, just, uh, yeah. So well, we'll open it up for questions from the many people who are here. In the absence of questions right away, maybe I can ask a question to get us started because I'd like to hear about this from, uh, I'd like to, it's a question for all of you actually, and maybe this can get us started thinking and we can we can have more more engagement. Um, so I was wondering if um, if we could talk a little bit or if each of you could, think a little bit about um, 
internationalism. So it, it's it seems like um, a big part of, um, and I was thinking about this particularly in your talk, Eli, right? Like a big part of this planning needs to be the planning that you're talking about, right? That would be capable of decolonizing, decarbonizing, um, would have to be an international process, right? Um, and so I wonder if you could say a little bit about um, what that means. And I'm particularly interested also in what that means for um, like in the global, like in the in the um, capitalist center, right? In like Western Europe and the United States, like what does that look like politically? Um, a commitment to this kind of um, decolonization project um, and I'm not saying that because I think the 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 capitalist center is like the most important place, right? Obviously, from from these talks, it seems like the that a lot of the theory that's gonna lead a way out is not developed there. But I'm asking it because I am somebody who lives in the United States, right? And I yeah, I wonder if we could we could think a little bit about that. Um, and I guess all of your talks kind of touch on this question, the internationalism question. Um, yeah. I'll, yeah. Whoever wants to go first. I can, I can respond first just because we have a weird audio thing. If that way we can just switch off our audio. Um yeah, um, unless Jared has an itch to go first again, <laughs> I'm happy to go first. Um yeah, this is a great question. Um, yeah, it's sort of you know, in a way, so as I mentioned, the remarks that I sort of made today are really schematic, but um, you know, I'm just sort of presupposing a, you know, um the sort of um you know, commitment to essentially a sort of class mediated, um, you know, internationalism, you know, what was maybe formerly, we just called proletarian internationalism, um, you know, um, in the days of the socialist camp. But, you know, interestingly, I, I actually think this is really a, a, a good rhetorical point, um, Ian, to sort of bring up, which is like, oftentimes, um, there's actually sort of, um, and I think this is especially true of the colonial context, there tends to be this emphasis on, like, disconnecting um, from the global economy in some way. Um, and that, you know, sort of things like economic nationalism or isolationism. And, and sometimes that's a defensive strategy, um, you know, and sometimes it's foisted forcibly upon you as in the case of Cuba, right? We've been under sanctions since like, you know, year one of the revolution, right? Um, but, you know, I think it may be important to say that, you know, um, the U.S. has to change. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, we, we, ha we have no choice but to um, get the United States to alter its domestic and foreign policy. Um, you know, if the it, it's a perfectly good thing, of course, um, you know, the third world forming an alliance to sort of strategically, you know, sort of um, offer a multipolar counter hegemonic force is um, absolutely necessary. Um, but of course, you know, the United States would still have the top five air forces. And that's, uh, that's sort of a, a fact that we also have to reckon with, um, right, if, if death tolls are what we're worried about. And so, um, to some degree, I actually think it's a, a good question to say, yeah, well, we, we should probably also, you know, sort of take it upon ourselves, you know, if for those of us living in the United States, we're just living within imperial states, that it is our responsibility to sort of, um, you know, pressure and resist, you know, the US imperial project, and its attempt to sort of seize um, upon the opportunity of climate change as a way to sort of consolidate its global hegemony. Um, what that looks like very concretely of course, would require a lot more time, but I think, un, you know, totally predictably, you know, my answer is going to be a party form. <laughs> um, we need, a, we need a, a party that can do that. Um, that's like a really basic answer that I would give. I don't know if that's adequate, but it's, it's the beginning of an answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, Larry, I don't know if you have a thought. Uh, Jared, just um, the, the question was about internationalism and the, the, the way to think um, the way to think about like also outside of the outside of the um, the context of countries that are colonized, right? But thinking about like what does internationalism demand like within the capitalist uh, you know capitalist center like the Western Europe and the United States. Um, so I was that was my question. Um, I don't know if either Larry or Jared yeah have answers to that. Oh, I'll I'll let Larry go first. Uh, since I can overcome the panic of the internet uh, <laughs> crapping out and, uh, and during the middle of this, but go ahead, Larry. I, I have thoughts, but yeah, I don't have um, too much more to add to what Eli said. Um, I would just maybe, uh, as a bit of an addendum, um, uh, 
in a very limited context and very limited framework um i think that um intellectuals academics theorists of, of whatever stripe um really just intellectuals more broadly right um i think it's really incumbent upon us not to let um the progressive conversation be hijacked by a kind of implicit nationalism um so often you know you'll hear you know especially in the context of um anyone who might try to position or um triangulate these kinds of more radical political economic goals over and against um a politics index to recognition of some kind um i think it's really incumbent upon us to come back and say you know um uh just to you know gesture back to my own talk right look at these studies on the mortality cost of carbon um and if you care about the uh the underprivileged and the subaltern and the marked objects of our world and so on and so forth then it doesn't really make sense to have any kind of politics except a left-wing internationalism um just sort of trying to take care of uh, those people in the global north, um, those people in the imperial centers, whatever term you like, right, who are underprivileged within it is, um, you know, obviously not just not enough and not just sort of uh, lacking, but it's also really pernicious, right, because it gives you this uh progressive credo, it gives you this progressive license uh, without actually having to think about people who happen to be beyond your your borders um just to re reiterate what Eli said really yeah I'm sorry I missed your your intervention Eli and so hopefully I don't repeat but I mean thinking about nationalism internationalism um one thing I didn't touch on in the talk uh is all, all the figures we've been addressing Cabral, Sankara, Samora Machel uh, their nationalisms are revolutionary nationalisms, right, which should be distinguished from uh, a reactionary nationalism, the kind of nationalism that emboldened the, you know, people who stormed the Capitol a couple of years ago, et cetera, et cetera. Um, fr from the sort of Leninist perspective, there's a history of this, right? So he was an ardent defender of the principle of national self-determination. But he saw this as a revolutionary principle, and he he you know he would reject any sort of nationalisms that he viewed as reactionary. Um, and I, I think it's that logic I, I I apply to the question of nationalism. Um, that if a nationalism is revolutionary and it, it it helps us all strive together toward the goal of international socialism, then then we should support it. But if it's you know reactionary nationalism conservative nationalism you can use any word you'd like uh then then we'd have to we'd have to we'd have to parse the good from the bad secondly it's just and, and this might be a bit flat-footed but um you know it's the perspective that we're all, all all striving for is one that tries to take into account the totality right um i think this is really important to think about the totality especially in addressing climate catastrophe ongoing climate catastrophe uh, especially from the so so if, and I, and maybe maybe that you mean something different by internationalism, but I, I, again, it's like we we need a theoretical perspective that can grasp the totality, but to understand how you know simple simply like greenwashing consumption uh, in the imperial center, the, it, it's you can't consume your way out of climate change, right? And um, even you know there, there there's that that Lori Parsons book that. Larry mentioned is really good on this question, carbon colonialism, because it's only from the point of view of a totality and thus perhaps an internationalism uh, 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 or international perspective, if you'd like, that we can really understand how the supply chains that link the center to the periphery are involved, are, are really um, one of the culprits, at least, that is, uh, you know, preventing us from reaching our decarbonization goals. Um, so, but yeah, well, hopefully that that addresses a little bit of um, your question, Ian. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, my question was just to get things started. Um, I see we have another question from Delia Popa. So um, yeah, Delia, go ahead. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for your great talks. I have a question that's inspired by both Jared's and um, Larry's talks. Um, and I guess it's addressed to the three of you. 
uh, Jared sketched some um, uh, something related to, to it already at the end of his answer. So my question is about um, the dialectical tools that we can use in order to shake the status quo of the democratic pluralism. And I was thinking about, particularly about this dialectics between um, the center and the periphery that you talked about, Jared, uh, and between the underdeveloped and the developed side of the world, right? Uh, dialectics that can be, I would guess, be turned in various directions and uh, oriented um, uh, in all sorts of ways. So I, I was just wondering, um, how are you guys thinking about that? How can we use uh, dialectics in order to uh, change the way in which the very problem, for example, of the uh, climate catastrophe is is addressed? Um, and I am aware that this is not a matter of, of philosophical methodology only, right? That's not only the only thing we're discussing. It's not just an epistemic challenge. But nevertheless, how are you guys thinking about that? Thank you. Uh, I, my, my fast answer would be, um, I, I think dialectics as a tool will lead us to exactly what Eli was talking about, which is a emphasis on rational planning the economy, um, especially in the colonial world, uh, in a more, I guess, theoreticist register, we could say that, I, I mean, Lenin and then, and then Lukács following Lenin, uh, talks a lot of be about the point of view of praxis point of view of the pro proletariat so it's it, it's and, and i think that and i think it is an inherently dialectical position so it's a, a um a theoretical perspective that not only describes the world or interprets the world uh but can actually transform it um how how it, it we would have to like then go into specifics about how this point of view um would operate given specific conjunctures i think um but I, i'll stop there and and you know i i think the real answer is that dialectics is going to lead us especially vis-a-vis -vis the question of underdevelopment well the, the answer and what it leads us to is this emphasis um, on rational planning I can speak to Delia's question a little bit, I think, too, um, although I know it was more inspired by the other two, which is totally okay. Um, yeah, maybe um, something that's sort of worth talking about is um, sometimes I think the way that um, historically, for instance, like the planning principle has been understood as actually sort of like necessarily kind of a violent imposition, you know, like planning always has to be foisted upon others uh, as if it wasn't like, you know, something, for instance, that, you know, um, I wish I actually had some of the uh, materials I use in class, but when I teach philosophy of decolonization, I, I often put up all these charts about, like, development in countries that implemented planned economies, and even when they were incredibly underdeveloped, they were rapidly able to develop a whole host of just like basic sort of infrastructural programs, just like basic medical care uh, much more rapidly. And so, you know, there's kind of this interesting, I think, um, you know, what sometimes might seem like an apparent tension between planning and, you know, responsivity. I wouldn't say it's democratic per se, because I think that sort of you know, sort of veers into the territory that I think Larry's worried about with regard to the kind of formalist problem. But in terms of being responsive and locally and regionally responsive and actually like addressing the substantive objective interests of human beings, as opposed to, for instance, capital accumulation, um, I actually think, you know, there's a lot of different ways that planning can sort of um, take up that question and, um, and a lot of different ways that planning, you know, can sort of look um, programmatically. I mean, um, you know, it's uh, obviously my my favorite test case is always the Cuban model, um, which, you know, existing under duress nonetheless has some um, pretty significant advantages in terms of responsivity, um, not just in terms of collecting information about needs um, and, you know, necessary sort of developments and deficits, but also in terms of trying to sort of um, implement cooperative um, and sort of, you know, uh, again, responsive sort of local elements of a nonetheless, you know, in, in Cuba's case, command economy, not just a centrally planning economy, but a command economy. Um, so I don't know, I guess I just wanted to sort of introduce the, the, the possibility that we don't have to sort of think of these as rigid oppositions, but not perhaps necessarily to sort of entertain too much the sort of liberal democratic model of 
uh, of responsivity. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's that's what I would say. Larry, do you have a thought about dialectics? <laughs> no, but I, I I mean I could add to what Eli said um, a little bit, uh, and again back to this book that Lori Parsons' uh, uh, Carbon Colonialism. I, I, I mean, I think it's a dialectical point of view or perspective that uh, can see that like the greenwashing of products in the Imperial Center is actually doesn't help the problem. It, it, it is contributes to the problem because, you know, underneath the greenwashing fetishism of consuming whatever product it has, happens to be, uh, it actually conceals the material relations uh, and, and more particularly the supply chains um, that get these greenwash products into our homes and into our hands, right? Um, and contributing even more so to the emissions problem. So if you look at the like the emissions of England, of their official report of the, U the UK, they, they like boast that they're like really great about their emissions or that they've, they're meeting all the goals. But if you then factor in the supply chains, right? The all the transportation infrastructure, everything else that goes into getting products extracted from the periphery into England and to the UK, then they the picture looks very different, right? That they are way exceeding and they're not meeting their goals at all. And I think that that shift, right, which is necessary tool of analysis, I think that that is dialectics. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier, right? That one one postulate, not postulate of dialectics, one one facet of dialectical thinking is thinking in terms of the totality and, and trying to realize all the connections and mediations of the whole, and in this case, the whole of the global economy, um, which is driving us further and further toward uh, uh, catastrophe, um, climate catastrophe. So that, that that's, that's what, especially again, and then rational planning would be in sort of an application of dialectics. Thank you so much, uh, panelists and, and Dahlia, for the question. Um, we have uh, two questions I see from Colin and from Constanza. Uh, let's go to Colin first, because I think you raised your hand first. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, great talks. Um, my question is kind of like one specific question and one broader question. The The specific question is about um, it is uh, about uh, what's going on in um, in Africa and Burkina Faso and other places where um, Jared, you mentioned like that um, there like the the standard like the the move of Sankara was to like eliminate the bourgeois state machinery and to transfer power to people and like have new institutions in play. And I'm wondering like what kind of stuff are we seeing go on in these countries that's like um, reorganizing different institutions um, uh, like uh, in a kind of Sankarist way. And then the second more general question about climate change is like, and that kind of stuff is like, and as well as in relation to this question about um, uh, Africa specifically is like, what is the role of like multipolarity in all of this in forming like climate alliances or forming anti-imperialist alliances and things like that, so. I'll maybe answer the the Africa question, then we, and then Eli and Larry maybe uh, the the second one. Um, as far as what Ibrahim Trahore is is doing uh, in terms of the class composition of Burkina Faso, and um, so so just briefly, right, that Sankara really his revolutionary nationalism completely reorganized the state apparatus vis-a-vis -vis the, the the class struggle. And it's not necessarily, like I said, tried to emphasize following the quote of Kwame Nkrumah, um, because colonial colonial states and neo-colonial states, what the the only the only development of the class class structure really that happens is you get a comprador petty bourgeoisie. But Sankara recognized that it was also like this is dialectics, right? We want to talk about that. That it's it's you know, it's also the most developed class. And so it's not about like, you know, murdering them all or something like that, but we need to, we need to re wrestle control away from them, but also we need to, we need to, you know, keep, keep them in, in, in the fold because they're the most de developed class intellectually, et cetera. Um, again, the, the answer is probably going to be disappointing for Ibrahim Troy is that I don't know because I don't have enough information. I've read a lot of journalistic stuff and been following really closely 
Um, but it, it, it's not sure. Uh, it, it's it's just it's still coming out, and it's uh, um, I'm not sure. I know that I, I forgot to mention that, and we've talked about this, Colin. Right? The uh, that Putin after after Trahore went to uh, Russia for the Africa summit in Russia. Putin is going to build the first nuclear power plant in Africa, outside of South Africa, in Burkina Faso, um, which is talk about some rational planning. Um, and and you know, and, and this is very very significant for this region because uh, as the Sahel country, right, this that band between the Sahara and the lush forests of the at West Africa is really fragile. Right, Sankara. So, so, so there seems to be for Trahore's project right now an ecological focus. Um, just as Sankara, as Eli mentioned, right, uh, he has a speech. Imperialism is the arsonist of our forests and savannas. He actually implemented a tree planting uh, um, program where, if you were punished rather than you, you know being sent to prison, um, but also for every occasion, like every official inst uh, state officiated you know marriage or whatever. They make people legally have to plant a tree, so it's a way of collectively engaging in combating desertification. Whether Trehore is has something like this on the agenda, not sure. I mean, we'll we'll just have to keep our eye on it. Uh, but but again, you know, the the nuclear power plant is at least a sign that that this is this is on his agenda. So we'll have to see. We'll see from Larry and Eli about the the question too. Yeah, I can say a few words about multipolarity. Um, I'm going to kind of parrot Vijay Prashad here, um, who I think has the best take on it that I've heard. Um, essentially, I think we have to think about multipolarity as a sort of uh, ad hoc or contingent good. Um, in the state of affairs that we find ourselves in now, you know, total more or less total U.S. hegemony, um, multipolarity is probably uh, good in the sort of short term immediate for now. Um, the any kind of fissure or crack that can appear in uh, the the present US's hegemony um, is probably a good thing. Um, but in terms of a longer, longer term, broader ambitions or goals, um, there's not really anything to recommend multipolarity as such on like a formal level um i think it would it would kind of be a, a repetition of the logic of pluralism that i uh, sort of critiqued in the the presentation right um this notion that well there being two or more sort of great powers or hegemonic blocks or something like this in the world is is just good so we can have alternatives right um but the thing is like when it comes to rapid decarbonization you know it, it's going to be increasingly difficult, uh, perhaps impossible to do that without, um, uh, I don't want to say functionally, you know, uh, <laughs> polar cooperation, right? put it that way. Um, and if we're thinking about a future world that is multipolar, um, I can't see that helping the task of decarbonization. I can only see it uh, hurting it, um, again, in the long term way. Uh, in the immediate, like tomorrow, yeah, multipolarity. Um, but toward the end of any kind of uh, project of transformation, I think that could probably be dropped. It's a bit akin to the, the question of nationalism mm -hmm. um, that sort of has an, an immediate ad hoc situational contingent value in certain contexts. But once you sort of get past that context, it becomes the, the opposite, right? It becomes kind of pernicious. Um, maybe there's something dialectical about that, <laughs> about uh, something reverting to its opposite or something like this, but uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a ton to add, but I, I do also want to speak a little to the multipolarity question. Um, I mean, my position is essentially uh, Larry's. I don't know that I need to reiterate it, but um, but I will say too, you know, there's, um, you know, I, I sort of find myself oftentimes when I'm doing research, you know, in the anti-colonial tradition, which is just kind of what I've been doing for a while now. I, I do find actually that um, the question of multipolarity, again, you know, aside from being sort of a, a counter hegemonic move, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the United States and um, Western Europe's um, sort of stranglehold um, on, you know, geopolitical economy, um, which, I mean, you know, 
maybe is being challenged and that's something that we can talk about that that would be a good thing i agree um but i sort of think you know if, when i'm reading about you know the history of some of these movements i oftentimes encounter events like the Sino-Soviet split, for instance, um, or I encounter, you know, the in immense fracturing, um, you know, caused by, but also internal to the non-aligned movement. And I think to myself, like, okay, here is why multipolarity is not necessarily guaranteed to produce better results. Um, because actually what it can do is sort of fracture, um, you know, our cap our capacity for a unified front, um, you know, and, and in essence, you know, if we're sort of thinking Thinking about this as a counter hegemonic strategy, um, then, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, um, multiplicity sort of as a counter hegemonic strategy, um, you know, internally, I mean, is um, necessarily all that helpful, right? It might actually sort of break some of the very crucial strategic and tactical surface tension that a kind of unified bloc actually presents. And again, you can just sort of hear, by the way, I'm talking about it. I'm clearly thinking about the you know, Soviet split, right? Which also ma had huge, massive Im implications for um, the alliance of the third world or not, right, with with either bloc or with the United States and so on. Um, so I don't know, I just sort of wanted to introduce that there there is sort of some historical context for thinking about multipolarity, not, not merely as a virtue, but also as, you know, something that has created an, uh, you know, occasionally a sort of unfortunate dissensus. So yeah, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, like any instrument, you know, useful when useful and not useful when not useful, you know, which it's, it's, it sounds, sounds tautological, but maybe, I don't know, gives us a way of thinking about it more practically. Yeah. But thanks for the question, Colin. Yeah. Thanks so much to our panelists. Um, we have another question from Constanza. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one was inspired by Ellie's talk, but it would be great to hear if Jared or Larry have any thoughts on that. It's about rational and planned control and decarbonization and anti-colonial struggles. I would like to hear if any of you have any examples of specific measures that in particular material and historical contexts have proven to be effective. And also, if you have any thoughts on the challenges that rational and planned economies face in implementing these measures. And the second one is um, about a theoretical conjuncture. Um, you've talked about the decolonial turn and pluralism, and I would like to hear if you have anything to say about the tasks that we have in the current uh, context with respect to this debates, particularly with anti-colonial struggles and decarbonizations as uh, crucial as a crucial horizon for us. Sorry, I was just writing. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I got the right thing you said. Um, yeah, so I I think I'm going to very conveniently leave the implementation challenges to Larry, <laughs> who is much more informed on certain of the. This is me gently saying Larry should talk a bit about the calculation debates because Larry's more informed about that, and that's you know one I think area where we can kind of talk about some of the implementation um, challenges. Um, you know. By no means am I suggesting that plan that you know planning is like um, a seamless or easy endeavor, but that doesn't you know I think maybe that some of those concerns about implementation for me just don't diminish its necessity like at an existential level you know um, so like its difficulty just cannot the seesaw just never tips you know it just it cannot be tipped um, by our you know not existing as Cabral puts it is sort of a precondition of all problems and so non existence um, in my in my view would sort of uh, preclude us you know from even dealing with any of the sort of application problems that there might be. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm just going to like, yeah, conveniently really kind of outsource that to Larry if he's willing. But um, so um, what I will sort of respond to is maybe what we can do as, in terms of uh, reacting to and against the decolonial turn. Um, because I will say I've actually had to struggle with this quite a bit. Um, you know, I... <laughs> I, yeah, as you all know, <laughs> I, I published an article in 2022, which I'm, you know, I was very excited about. I worked really hard on and I'm very proud of. I can share it with you if you're interested. But um, for those of you in the audience who are listening, um, but, you know, even like in the process of producing this article, which was very much to sort of represent here are kind of the basic principles of anti-colonial Marxism. Here's sort of an attempt to start 
building a cannon. Um, again, it's an, it's, it was a preliminary attempt. So, you know, d don't keep your hopes up too high, but um, I tried, you know, it's a preliminary effort, but, but even in that process, I was going through the peer review process and it's like, the, I got the same feedback every time, which is don't critique uh, the, the modernity coloniality group. Don't critique the subaltern studies group. Feel free to posit your own view as additional, right? So again, the presupposition that these views can exist pluralistically alongside one mm -hmm. another. And not that they are ideologically opposed, for instance, which is my view of them. Um, you know, so interestingly, the terrain is really um, uh, interestingly. I've I've actually had plenty good luck being able to articulate um, anti-colonial Marxism, like in sort of the academic context, as long as it's not pitted explicitly against the decolonial turn, which is sort of curious, but in some ways totally unsurprising if we're sort of thinking about the ideological function of the academy um, in sort of you know, wanting to say, well, this view is one among others and not necessarily a preferable view or one that, um, you know, represents, um, you know, a wider range of explanatory power or, you know, um, emancipatory power historically or anything like that. So I would say if you can manage to get out <laughs> a pervasive critique of, uh, you know, the decolonial turn, specifically as it's represented by, um, you know, people like um, the modernity coloniality group, people like, you know, um, Walter Mignolo, Ramon Grossvogel, Maldonado Torres, you know, this sort of camp of people. And on the other hand, it's kind of earlier iteration um, in, in the subaltern studies group. It's many of the claims are actually quite similar. Um, you know, they're very similar, in fact, although there is actually a, a sort of relatively prominent uh, Marxist tendency within post-colonial studies that's resisted that. And to give people like Benita Pari and Neil Lazarus, who've, um, and of course, um, Ayaz Ahmad, who've been like resisting this, you know, impulse for a million years, you know, but if, I, I think in some ways it's sort of been unsung heroes of not letting subaltern studies completely um, dominate uh, post-colonial uh, theory. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, people like, um, you know, Dipesh Chakrabarty, who is also sort of uh, encroaching on climate discourse, um, you know, people like Homi Baba and and so on, right? The list goes on. Um, I think this is a, you know, this is something that needs to be challenged. Um, I have, other than sort of outside of teaching, I haven't found a way to get past the peer review um, safety guards rails. Uh, I, I haven't really been able to do it because um, it's always like, we'll just focus on the positive intervention and don't sort of upset the existing um, sort of ideological order. I don't know how to advise on that particular question. I really don't. Um, you know, I would say, of course, I, I would prefer to be able to make this positive intervention whenever I can. And that's, you know, I'll use whatever opportunities I get for that purpose. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think it would be great to organize something around this, maybe that's, uh, you know, me gently, you know, uh, poking you and saying, perhaps we need to organize something around this so that we can kind of have a, a public forum for discussion. Um, because the peer review process is sometimes a little, uh, <laughs> a little strenuous with regard to um, critiques of this kind. Yeah, I know. It's not hopeful remarks, but, you know, that's been my experience. Yeah. Hmm. Larry and Jared, wondering if you have any responses, because there was a lot in Constanza's question. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, can yeah, uh, yeah. say something really quickly. Um, uh, well, not quickly. Um, I'm going to give myself a time limit, though, because <laughs> I'll just talk past the remaining time we have left, if you let me. Um, yeah, with regard to your, your question about like what challenges something like economic planning would face, um, obviously, there's the challenge of um, getting something like the American population on board with something like nationalization and so on and so forth. Obviously, there's there's all of that. There's all the political challenges there. Um, but something I'm I'm starting to think about now, I've been thinking about it for a few months, is responding to people who, uh, you know, have otherwise decent, more broadly decent moral sentiments, you know, are concerned about climate change, um, concerned about its mortality cost and so on and so forth. And they don't necessarily have like a principled opposition to something like economic planning, you know, so people who are not libertarians, people who are not radical individualists and so on and so forth, um, people who don't have a kind of red scare mentality. Um, but people on the sort of progressive centrist end of the spectrum um, who just will, you know, say, say something along the lines of, you know, planning doesn't work. Um, it just that logistically doesn't work. Um, and I think this is actually the group of people that we need to work on convincing. Um, 
I don't know if it makes a lot of sense to argue with a libertarian or an anarchist or someone like this. Um, you can't argue with people who don't believe in reason, you know. Um, but um, so sort of what I'm turning to now is work trying to work out the, uh, I don't want to say work out the logistics of a planned economy, but <laughs> work out some of the theoretical difficulties in uh, the notion of a planned economy, above all the allocation of resources. Um, so Eli just briefly mentioned the, the calculation debates of the 1920s. Um, and very briefly, the, the, the problem as the, the Austrian school economists like Mises and Hayek saw it was that uh, in a centrally planned economy, you don't have a way to actually rationally determine prices. So it's just, um, you know, and, and that becomes a problem insofar as there's no way to distribute goods um beyond just first come first serve take whatever you want here's what we have right and then you know i might show up and get 10 lawnmowers and then there's no lawnmowers for anyone else and so on and so forth right um because the plan called for 10 lawnmowers but the first person at the lawnmower shop got all the lawnmowers right something like this it just becomes a big mess and um not quite something that crude but problems like that really did plague uh actually existing planned economies um and so I think a sort of theoretical and political task for the future would be trying to uh, uh, troubleshoot that, trying to troubleshoot um, the actual concrete, or at least be able to provide answers to these, again, otherwise legitimate questions. Um, someone in the chat is asking how it was done in World War II, and that's a very good question. <laughs> um, you know, governments clearly are capable of planning something around a goal. Um, and I think that needs to be part of the conversation as well. Um, but I don't want, I think this is a mistake to sum all this up. Or I don't want to just say something like, well, if you don't agree with the economic planning, you're a, a reactionary libertarian and I don't care what you think, right? Um, there are legitimate questions to be asked um, and we would have to work on answering them. Um, but like I said, I would, I'm going to go on for an hour if you let me. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Jared. Trying to unmute myself. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have much to add. Uh, first, I'll add um, it's in the chat now, but Eli's article is really excellent on the theoretical uh, question. And I've drawn a lot of inspiration in my own work just from this article. Um, so everyone go read that uh, one thing. Um, you know, with respect to what I, I spoke about, uh, I, I, one thing I maybe didn't completely emphasize. But speaking about this, this illusion of neocolonialism that uh, Cabral speaks about, uh, you know, something like the, the problem of neocolonialism or neocolonial domination is not visible without a historical materialist lens. Um, so for the theoretical conjuncture, I think one thing to say is like, especially for us as academics in the Imperial Center, at least most of us, um, you know, struggling to uh, reactivate this anti-colonial Marxist tradition, materialist tradition, is really important. This is part of the class struggle. Um, in order to, the next step is to address the problem. I mean, if something, you know, in the region, in Africa today, right, the, the, the hegemonic discourse is, it, it takes the temperature, the political temperature of the region in terms of how well democracy is functioning, scare quotes uh, to emphasize here, right? <laughs> And you know, with the recent coups, right? With the coup in Niger and in Gabon that just happened a couple months ago, uh, you hear immediately what what are, even on the left and the right, uh, it's it's you know fears about democracy uh, dwindling or fears of democracy under threat in this region. And you know, this is the theoretical lens through which we're evaluating the geopolitical developments in this this region. And so so something like again neo-colonial imperialism. Uh, which uh, I forgot to add in my talk is like, especially with the concealment of supply chains is a big factor, is a huge and, and often not even calculated contributor to the, the climate problem. So so that's like one little point I want to add. It's just like the visibility of these 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 realities um, can only happen through all this 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 theoretical optic that we're privileging from. So so yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, these are great questions, and I know we're only going to we're all going to feel like we're only at the beginning of the discussion by the time we're done in nine minutes here. Um, I have a question from the chat, which is about, um, and then I have a question um, from Michelle. Um, 
the question from the chat is, um, as evidenced by the presentation, um, um, and which is shown in the resistance of the Western world to change its behavior, like regarding carbon consumption, what strategy can we provide to change behavior? Like, how can we think about that? Maybe this is mostly directed towards Larry, I would say, but but I'm, I I don't maybe not yeah. Uh, yeah, um, a very short answer just because we're low on time. Um, it does bear pointing out that um, if we're looking at something like greenhouse gas emissions from the global north or the Imperial Center, um, it's overwhelming and uh, it's sort of an overwhelming disproportionality between the lifetime consumption of a millionaire or a billionaire and the lifetime carbon consumption or greenhouse gas emissions of someone who's not a millionaire or a billionaire. Um, um, so I think that it's uh, as a, a first step, a uh, first step for thinking about how to move forward in that respect, right, would be to keep uh, keep going, keep uh, feeding the sentiment that's become increasingly common in the last five to 10 years in the United States that uh, maybe millionaires and billionaires don't need to exist. Um, so I don't think, you know, these two things are not unconnected, right? Uh, economic inequality uh, and um, and decarbonization, uh, very much intricately, intricately connected and not two separate issues. Let's see whether Michelle, um, yeah, Michelle, if you have a question, we have just a little bit of time left. You're muted, I think, Michelle. Hi, are you listening to me? Sorry. So I, I'd like to know some some thoughts from what's the role of the colonial or post-colonial theory in opposition to anti-colonial thinking? Like how does epistemologic focused theories have produced uh, in the sterilized um, kind of social movements and parties and union, like social forces that can't actually fight the system? like what happened in Ecuador and what happens in Latin America in general. Sorry, there's a puppy crying here. Um, but I feel like re the revolution revolutionary left in Latin America has to, to fight not only fascism, but also this progressive narrative from the progressive field. Like there's any progress going on and there's no hope beyond capitalism. And how does narrative contribute to the well destruction of the of the planet as much as the liberal theories do? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, thanks so much, Michelle. Could could I actually just get really clear on what the question is? I just want to make sure I understand. So, are you sort of asking about? Um, specifically sort of in the context of, you know, directions for the Latin American left, specifically the revolutionary left, um, in terms of its response to the kind of spread of various sort of liberal strains of, you know, you know, quote unquote resistant thought like decolonial thought? Is that sort of where your question is coming from? Yeah, no, just like how the mm -hmm. decolonial theory, like the decolonial mm -hmm. Latin yeah. American theory, how yeah. it contributes with the liberal narrative or oh, the democracy mm -hmm. narrative um, in, you know, in opposition to the anti-colonial theory, which mm -hmm. um, asks for rupture and for revolution. And, and the yeah. decolonial theory is more like, no, yeah. we, we can work it out inside the limits. You know? <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now I got, I was like, I wasn't, I just wanted to make sure you, what the question was. Um, is it okay if I go first, you guys? Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, okay, actually this, it's bad you went last because I really have a lot to say about this. Um, I actually, um, just as a shortcut, in case you want to hear my <laughs> rantings about this particular disposition of thought, uh, I do actually have the draft of the article still up on my academia.edu so people can see <laughs> the original version, which contains 
um, a kind of step-by-step -step, like rejection of the various presuppositions of the decolonial um, you know, disposition. But I would say maybe that the most decisive, of course, is that they just sort of categorically rely on the narrative of historical failure. Um, they've just sort of really internalized this um, and, and done so in a way that um, can only be described as Cold Warrior-esque. I mean, it's it's kind of like there are passages for actually a lot of people try, for instance, to spare like Aníbal Quijano, who's maybe like from an earlier generation of, you know, this thought. But there are passages in Quijano that describe, you know, the revolutions in Latin America as, I mean, Eurocentric mirages, for instance, is one turn of phrase. Um, there's just like a patently um, sort of reformist disposition, I think, that's sort of built into this thought. And I think, you know, weirdly and kind of unsurprisingly, um, you know, there's also a tendency to really reify a colonial difference, you know, for all the insistence um, on difference, um, there's really never a historical problematization of how that uh, difference comes to be and how it emerges, um, right? As if, you know, cultural and international differences were merely, you know, neutral or, you know, natural features that were unchanging. Um, I mean, of course, I think maybe the last thing I would say about it is, um, you know, the kind of um, romanticization, for instance, of pre-Columbian society, which is also very, I think, characteristic of this um, particular movement, um, I think also, um, you know, really curiously betrays the kind of, um, you know, again, nativist and deeply identitarian. Um, and again, I, I mean that in the sense of not simply a sensitivity to identity concerns, but a deeply um, you know, sort of rooted in this kind of positionality as a, as a rigid determinant of one's political capability. Um, I think this is maybe one of the most demobilizing <laughs> um, attitudes one can have at a theoretical level. It's really, really demobilizing. Um, but yeah, I think um, I think Gabriel actually, or someone just shared in the chat uh, a link to that uh, that draft article. So, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. So please, let's have an exchange about it. You know, feel free to email. I'd love to talk more. Uh, thanks so much for your question. Yeah. Larry? I don't know if Larry or Jared have an additional thought on that, but we have about two minutes left. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll keep it very concise because I could say a lot about the juxtaposition uh, between the, the liberal multicultural or epistemic tradition of decolonization versus the tradition for which we're advocating. Um, one thing, and so Colin, who's here today with us, uh, reminded me of the opening of the introduction by Michel Foucault of Deleuze and Guattari's um, anti-Oedipus, in which he says, you know, we shouldn't, you know, worry about fascism out in the world, uh, and we should just focus on fighting the fascists, identifying and fighting the fascists in us, the hidden fascists in our minds. Um, and, and Colin pointed out that this is sort of absurd, right? Um, with respect to you know what what happens in World War II, right? It, to advocate this position is is extremely reactionary, extremely conservative, because you know there's fascism happening right in front of us, right? And but really, what we should concern ourselves with is you know fixing ourselves, right? And I think I think just thematically, right? That that once we once we make epistemic decolonization the problem, we've displaced it out of a concern for the totality, for really transforming the world. And we've made it, we've confined it, quarantined the issue to making it a individual problem that you can, I don't know, go to therapy or do whatever uh, in order to, to overcome. And so I think really what's crucial to the, one of the emphasis, and I've said this many times, right, uh, it, it's it, the focus on the totality and also the focus on not just transforming yourself, but transforming the world, right? These are the things that the anti-colonial tradition are uniquely situated to the questions it's uniquely situated to pose and as well as to answer, right? And so that, that's that's what I'll say, even though I'm sure all of us can say a lot more about that. Well, thank you so much, um, everybody, to our to our three panelists, uh, Eli Portea, Larry Allen Busk, and Jared Bly. And thank you to all of you for attending um, and to the Critical Theory Workshop for organizing this. Um, yeah, really appreciative uh, of everybody. I see the clapping yellow Zoom hands happening. I'm trying to add mine to the, to the mix, but I'm failing. Um, great, thanks everybody. <laughs>